Section 7 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 7. Andrea Delphin by Paul Heise, Part 4. The effect on Venice of this terrible discovery resembled the effect of the second and fatal shock of an earthquake. The first shock had caused surprise and terror, a terror which the very suddenness rendered fleeting, as the realization of what had happened could not penetrate the consciousness so quickly. But this second shock brought full comprehension. It was not possible to conceal the fact that the wounded man was one of the three. This time the dagger had been turned aside by a heavy undergarment, and the victim was not dead. But the injury was very serious, possibly fatal, and caused a pause in the business of the secret tribunal, as the consent of all three members was necessary for every decree. Worse even than this laming of the power of government, was the apparent penetrating of the secrecy which surrounded all its acts and which surrounded the very personality of its possessors the choice and election of the third inquisitor had been carried out in the council of ten with the utmost secrecy protected by the most solemn oaths and yet a few days later a blow had struck down the newly elected inquisitor the thought lay near that treason must dwell in the very innermost circles of the government itself. The secretary of the Inquisition, the last person to see the wounded man before the attack, was arrested, submitted to the most severe examinations, and threatened with a terrible death, but all in vain. Venice was practically in a state of siege after this second attack. Half the city was in the service of the government to watch the other half. The streets were patrolled day and night. The wearing of masks or the carrying of weapons of any sort was forbidden under pain of severe punishment. And every gondola that landed passengers at the case was inspected. No one was allowed to leave Venice, and a ship at the entrance to the harbor held up even the messengers of the government. Far beyond the limits of the city, the news of these conditions spread like a panic. Anyone planning a journey to Venice postponed it indefinitely. Merchants having business connection with Venetian houses withdrew their orders until the reign of terror should have passed over. Inside the town, the nobles left their houses only under pressure of dire necessity, and refused to receive visitors, as it was impossible to know that one's nearest friends might not be concerned in the conspiracy. Even the common people, usually unconcerned in the quarrelings of the higher powers, felt the increasing gloom of the nameless terror that had seized upon the entire town. Among the few people who did not allow the panic to influence their thoughts or actions was Andrea Delphin. The morning following the deed he had been ordered to the palace and put through an examination as to what he might have seen and heard during the hour of the attack. He said that he had been out on the Lido, endeavouring to discover the opinions of the fishermen. His friend Samuele had at once reported his noticeable friendliness with Baron Rosenberg. Andrea explained this by his former acquaintance with the young secretary, which could only be of use to the tribunal. He spent some part of every day with his German friend, as the two men had begun to find more and more real pleasure in each other's society. The baron told Andrea laughingly that he had been warned against him as a secret spy of the tribunal, but Andrea's calm answer gave the other an assurance which was scarcely needed, as his confidence in his Italian friend was complete. One day, as Andrea was leaning over the edge of a railing, looking down at the quiet waters of the canal, 
someone called his name from a gondola and he saw baron rosenberg waving eagerly to him from the cabin have you an hour free cried the young man then come with me i am in a hurry but want to speak to you when andrea had entered the boat the baron continued pressing his friend's hand warmly i am very glad indeed to have met you i would have been very sorry to have had to depart without bidding you good-bye but i feared for your sake to visit you or even to send for you you are going away asked andrea startled i must my dear mother is worrying about me i have a piteous letter from her begging me to return her physician tells me that i must be with her or she will fall seriously ill here is the letter when andrea had read it he returned it to the other saying it is indeed touching and yet i could almost wish that you would not go just now not alone because i shall be so utterly solitary when you are gone but it is not safe now for any one to leave venice for you to do so would be to incur suspicion of flight have you had any difficulty in obtaining permission to leave not the slightest but how could they prevent me i am a member of the embassy then you have a double reason for caution many a door stands invitingly open here in venice which leads to an abyss beyond if you will follow my advice you will not show yourself so openly in the streets the last hours before your departure you cannot tell what may be done to prevent your going but what can i do asked the young man you know it is forbidden to wear masks then stay at home and let the representatives of the republic wait in vain for your farewell visit when do you leave to-morrow morning at five i expect to be away about a month now that i have fully decided to go i am most glad of this heroic treatment although it hurts me cruelly when i am far away from the fatal charm of the enchantress i may be able to throw off the spell of her power for ever and yet would you believe me dear friend i tremble at thought of parting the best cure for that would be to part from her at once you mean not to see her again you ask too much andrea caught the other's hand my dear friend he said with more tenderness than he had ever shown before i have no right to ask any sacrifice of you but the deep affection that has drawn me to you from the very first gives me the courage to make a request of you i beg of you by the memory of your noble mother do not go to the countess's house i have a premonition strong enough to be almost a certainty that some terrible evil will befall you if you see this woman during the last hours before your departure promise me i beg of you promise me rosenberg shook his head gravely do not ask a promise of me be content that it is my will to follow your advice but the demon may be stronger than i am myself they sat silent for some time while the gondola moved gently through the quiet waters near the rialto andrea caused the boat to halt as he would be obliged to leave his friend here he started and trembled slightly at the other's question whether he would still be in venice a month later he held his friend's hand for some time and stood looking at the boat long after it had moved on andrea delphin had long since cut himself loose from all ties that could bind him to another personality the terrible task that he had set for himself had seemed to kill all human instincts within him but he himself was astonished at the pain the parting from this young man awoke in his heart he found himself wishing that he might not see him again until his work was done he decided to write to the mother and warn her not to allow her son to return to venice the thought seemed to cause him great relief and he hurried home to carry out his intention at once but alone in his gloomy room he could not control the unease and distress that kept him pacing up and down the narrow space he knew that the softening of his heart did not come from any twinge of conscience or from any fear of the discovery of his terrible secret that very morning he had been called before the secretary of the tribunal and had seen how complete was the panic of the government the wounded inquisitor still lay between life and death 
one blow more and the building with its undermined foundations must fall for ever andrea felt no doubt as to his mission no doubt as to the protection of providence for his work it was a something else a vague premonition he could not understand which made him uneasy now and would not allow him to regain his usual iron composure the tenor of his thoughts was interrupted as twilight fell by a sound at smeraldina's window opposite he had neglected the girl lately and now hastened to make up for this with particular friendliness as he found the connection too useful to lose smeraldina was soon reconciled and told him that her countess was expecting a number of gentlemen to play cards that evening is the german baron coming the one you told me of asked andrea he why of course not he is so jealous that he will never enter the house if he knows any one else is here besides he is going away and we are not sorry andrea breathed a sigh of relief at ten o'clock as arranged he stood before the portal of the palace waiting for the girl to let him in the air was thick the night cloudy and the few passers through the little square wrapped themselves in their cloaks as andrea stood and waited he remembered the evening that another candiano had crossed this threshold to meet his death he shivered and the hand he held out to the girl a moment later was icy cold once in her room he would not consent to sit down at the richly spread table she had prepared but persuaded her to allow him to look through the crack in the wall once more pretending great curiosity to see what a card party among rich people might be like he spoke jokingly and protested that he would return to her very soon when he had taken his uncomfortable position on the little platform and looked down at the neighboring room he would scarcely have recognized it again tall mirrors reflected the light of many candles and their golden frames shot out flashes that awoke answering gleams from the painted walls jewels sparkled on the white throat of the fair leonora but her eyes were tired and rested with indifference on the cards and on the faces of the young men about her the money passed rapidly from hand to hand at the card table one young gallant weary of the game sat on a divan singing sentimental barcaroles to the accompaniment of the lute while servants passed noiselessly over the thick carpet carrying trays of refreshments the watcher on the platform was about to retire seeing nothing to interest him when one of the great doors was suddenly opened and a stately figure entered the card room greeted by a sudden respectful silence it was a man past middle age carrying his white head still proudly erect on stalwart shoulders he threw a quick glance over the young men and bowed to the countess as he prayed her not to allow him to disturb the company you are asking too much sir malapiero answered the countess these young men have too much respect for the many services you have rendered the republic that they should continue their sinful pastime in your presence you mistake fair leonora said the newcomer i have long since retired from all political activity and find myself still young enough at heart to wish to enjoy a merry hour over cards and wine in the presence of beauty but i do not come to-night to lay claim to your hospitality i stepped in for a moment to bring you news of your brother news which i have received from genoa to-night it's good news and will not spoil your mood therefore i feel free to ask for a few moments of your time may we step in here he pointed to the door of the great hall andrea started up but realized that it would be impossible for him to leave his place without being seen with quick decision he laid himself flat on the floor of the platform in a position which enabled him to hide behind the low railing he heard the opening of the door the rustle of the countess's gown and the step of the old man who followed her asserting that he did not need a light for the few words he had to say the door closed behind them and they stood just below the platform why do you come here 
asked the countess hastily do you bring me the news that gritty will return you have not fulfilled the conditions fair leonora you have not revealed to us any of the secrets from vienna is it my fault i did everything a woman could do and this stubborn german is absolutely my captive but not a word of business would pass his lips and he's going away to-day as you know i am ill of annoyance over the whole matter it would be more agreeable to us if it were he who were ill what do you mean he is going away and it is not possible for us to stop him but we are quite certain that he has important messages to carry to vienna and he must be prevented from reaching there it is you who can hold him and how send him a messenger to come to you at once he will surely come and when he does it must be your care that he shall fall ill she interrupted hastily i have vowed never to do that sort of thing again you will receive absolution and we do not wish that he shall die in fact that would make it very disagreeable for us do what you will she said but leave me out of it is this your last word countess it is well then it will have to be arranged that the traveller shall meet with an accident on his journey and gritty we will speak of him another time permit me to lead you back to your guests the door of the hall opened and closed behind them andrea could now leave his post without danger but the words he had heard lamed him in mind and body he rose with difficulty and staggered down the steps his hand clutching at the dagger hidden in his coat his lips were bleeding where his teeth had pressed them but he had sufficient control to rejoin smeraldina to chat with her for a few moments leave her the contents of his purse and then ask her to lay the bridge to his window again as he crossed the plank with a steady foot a decision stood firm within his soul it was time for action again action that had for incentive not alone the great cause to which he had devoted himself he must strike and strike well to save a friend from treachery to send a son safe home to a waiting mother he walked softly through the corridor of his own house and out into the quiet street until he reached the little square in front of leonora's palace he had seen no waiting gondola anywhere and concluded from this that the man he sought intended to go home on foot the black shadow of a column near the door gave him sufficient shelter. He stood here, his dagger firm in his hand, watching and waiting. In his heart and brain the vague voices that had troubled him before were alive again. Cold drops stood out on his forehead. With a sigh of relief he thought to himself that this might be the last time it occurred to him that malapiero would probably be accompanied by lackeys and he was astonished at the feeling of relief it gave him to think that it would be useless to wait this time but just as he was about to move from his shadow the door of the palace opposite opened and a single stately figure wrapped in a cloak stepped out into the black night white hair fell from under the hat rim a quick firm step beat the stone pavement as the belated wanderer kept close to the shadow of the houses now he had approached the blackness where stood the avenger he had passed him ten or twenty steps suddenly he heard a footfall behind him he turned threw back his coat to free his sword but in the same moment he staggered and fell the steel had struck to his heart mother my poor mother groaned the murdered man then his head sank back on the pavement and his eyes closed for ever a deep silence followed the words the dead man lay stretched across the street with arms outthrown his hat had fallen back from his forehead and under the disguise of the white wig curly brown hair appeared the youthful face seemed sleeping in the pale night-light 
A step or two distant, the murderer stood leaning against the wall of the nearest house, his eyes staring wildly at the face opposite him, his tortured brain trying to pierce the spell of ghostly enchantment that seemed to hold it enthralled. Must he not see in this face the features of the old man he had watched a few moments before in Leonora's hall? Was it not just because of the man who lay here that he had struck the blow? And what was it the man there had said as he fell? The blood rushed back from his head to his heart. His eyes, suddenly clearing, could plainly see the dagger in the dead man's breast. He read aloud the words on the handle, words that his own hand had graven in the steel. Death to all inquisitors! The thoughts whirled through his brain in hideous haste. He suddenly understood. It was no miracle, this hideous thing that had happened. It was all quite natural. The boy had remained away from his enchantress throughout the day. But when evening came, he could no longer resist the spell of the demon, and had come to her door. At the portal they had told him that the countess was not alone and he had turned to leave the house again. And then it was that his only friend in all the city had sprung upon him, to murder him, to murder him because of the disguise which this very friend had advised. The door of the palace opened again, and a tall figure wrapped in a cloak came out into the street. The light from the vestibule fell on the white hair of Sir Malapiero, returning to his home. Andrea looked up, the horrible irony of his position cutting deep into his soul. There walked the man from whom he had thought to free the city, to free the helpless oppressed citizens, and to free his own friend. This man walked toward him alone, unguarded, save in the mask of a secret which his enemy had penetrated. There was nothing to turn aside the dagger that was aimed for his heart. But this dagger was stained with innocent blood. The judge and avenger equally sinful with those whom he had condemned. There was no difference between them, except that the one had been impelled by evil chance, the others by evil intention. All this world through Andrea's brain. He started up drew the dagger from the wound, and fled through the shadow before the aged triumvir had seen him. As he ran, his heart was torn by the agony of the thought that Malapiero would find the dead man, and would breathe a thanks to the unknown murderer who had relieved him of a dangerous and difficult task. It was long past midnight when a man sprang out of a gondola, and knocked at the door of a lonely convent that stood on a little point of land far out beyond the city. In the convent dwelt a few Capuchin monks, who lived on the charity of the surrounding fishermen, and in return gave them spiritual aid and comfort. The solitary man, Andrea Delphin, knocked more loudly at the door. A moment later a voice from within asked who it was. A dying man, he answered. Call brother Pietro Maria if he's in the convent. The doorkeeper retired, and Andrea sat down on the stone bench beside the house, took a notebook from his pocket, and began to write hastily. This was what he wrote. To Angelo Quirine. It is a doomed man who writes to you now, a doomed man to whom your noble deeds gave courage to dare to resist the tyranny which had crushed out his entire family. Do you remember young Candiano, who many years before was introduced to you in the Palazzo Morosini? I was then a young man, living the customary life of pleasure of my kind, thinking neither of the past nor the future. It was you who first reminded me of the great deeds my forefathers had done in service of the state. It was you who first led me to study the history of my poor country, and to understand 
how terribly this republic of venice had fallen through a tyrant's hand from her once high estate inspired by you i won my brother orso from his life of idle pleasure and it was thus we drew upon ourselves the vengeance of those who held the power i will not trouble you with the recital of the means that were taken to crush out our family as well as many others of the independent landed nobility enough to say that my brother died by poison my sister perished in the flames that destroyed our home and i was supposed to have shared her fate but i had escaped how i do not know and by sheerest accident i had found papers belonging to one of my servants this afforded me a possibility of allowing the belief in my death to spread abroad while i could sink my personality in that of another my hair had grown white in a single night my features aged as if by many years when i recovered from the deep apathy into which the loss of all those dear to me had sunk me i had but one thought that of vengeance then came i was living quietly in brescia under the name of my servant then came the news of your noble deed and its shameful defeat i gathered my broken energy together waited for a while to strengthen my hatred and my purpose and then set forth to carry out in secret by my own hand alone the work which you could not perform by an open appeal to justice i felt assured that there was no hatred in my soul for any one person no desire for revenge for personal suffering nothing but the sacred will to raise my hand in the avenging of the sorrows of my country but it is for god alone to mete out vengeance i would have played the judge and have become a murderer i took upon myself that which belonged alone to god and god has punished me with my own weapons and has allowed me to shed innocent blood it is not yet time for a task such as mine god has refused the sacrifice that i would bring him i go now to meet the face of the highest judge that he may pass judgment upon my sin and my suffering i have nothing more to expect of mankind of you i pray only a passing pity for my error and my unhappiness candiano long before the writer had finished the door of the convent had opened and a venerable monk stood behind him andrea arose pietro maria he said i thank you that you have answered my call will you grant one more request to an unhappy man and take this letter safely to the exile in venice will you promise me i promise you god will reward you farewell he turned away without taking the hand the monk held out to him entered his gondola and steered toward the open sea the old man who had hastily read the lines on the page before him called after him in alarm and begged him to return but received no answer greatly moved and excited the venerable monk stood watching the last scion of a noble family pass out over the waves which began to dance before the fresh morning breeze when the gondola was near the gray horizon the dark figure in it rose to its feet threw back a farewell look over land and sea and toward the dim outlines of the city just visible above the mists of the lagoons one moment it stood motionless then with a the spring it disappeared beneath the waves the monk who watched folded his hands and prayed silently then he loosened his boat from its chain and rowed out into the sea where the empty gondola danced on the crest of the waves there was no trace of the man who had taken it out to this lonely spot end of section seven 
read by Lars Rolander.